You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, stocktwits.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com. The Options Insider Radio Network is sponsored by Fidelity Investments. Fidelity's Option Trade Builder tool can help you confidently build an options trade in three simple steps. Just choose a strategy, select a contract, and then review the benefits and risks of the trade. Learn more about Option Trade Builder at fidelity.com backslash options. Options trading entails significant risk and is not appropriate for all investors. Certain complex option strategies carry additional risk. Before trading options, contact Fidelity Investments by calling 800-544-5115 to receive a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSC SIPC. Bitcoin, Ether, Ripple, Litecoin, and more. Cryptocurrencies and other digital assets are taking the financial world by storm. This exploding market provides everything a savvy trader needs. Volatility, volume, and liquidity. Provided you know how to find it. That's where we come in. Welcome to the Crypto Rundown. Each week, we'll break down the latest trading activity, trends, and developments on everything from coins to tokens, futures, and even OTC options. If it's moving the crypto markets, then you'll find it on the Crypto Rundown. The Crypto Rundown is brought to you by Acuna Capital. Known as the new wave in tech and trading, Acuna is a leading derivatives market maker in traditional asset classes. As one of the first trading firms to make markets on Bitcoin futures, Acuna is also proud to be an innovator in the cryptocurrency space. Through a collaborative flow of knowledge between developers, quants, and traders, Acuna designs and implements their own low latency technologies, trading strategies, and mathematical models. To learn more about our rapidly growing firm, please visit acunacapital.com. Now it's time to dive into the exploding world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time for the Crypto Rundown. All right, everybody, that music means it is time once again for the Crypto Rundown, the program here on the old network where we break down the ever-evolving, ever-interesting world of Bitcoin and other digital assets trading out there. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-compelling, at least we hope so, Options Insider Radio Network. Glad you guys could join us here. Of course, you can get this show. Usually, I know the time's moved around a little bit, so we, we appreciate you bearing with us on the live end. But uh, usually, every Monday, that's about 4 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Eastern. Why is it so late in the day? Well, of course, we have a lot of diverse guests on the show, many of them coming from different areas of the globe. And so it, this is a little bit easier to accommodate their schedules. Of course, you can get the podcast wherever you get the rest of our programs, just subscribe in there. You should be all set. And, of course, however you listen, live after the fact, make sure you get those questions, those comments, those insights, those guest requests in. We do indeed like to hear from you guys. And speaking of guests, let's get right to it with our very next crypto hot seat. Forget about cold storage. It's time to turn up the heat on thought leaders from the world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time to take their place on the, the Crypto, crypto hot, hot Seat. All right, everybody, welcome to the Crypto Hot Crypto Hot Seat. Easy for me to say today. Still coming back from a bit of a of a cold over here. This is where we bring on guests from throughout the world of crypto and digital assets trading. Proceed to to pick their brains for the benefit of you guys out there. And today's guest is a newcomer to the Crypto Rundown program, even though he was on our network last year, towards the end of last year. So we're happy to have him back. He is Josh Greenwald, the CEO over there at LXDX. Josh, welcome to the Crypto Rundown program. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. 
Congratulations on the show. It's uh, definitely a pleasure to be on. I look forward to chatting about the intersection of crypto and options trading and all of this. Yeah, you know, there's a lot going on in that neck of the woods. And we waited and we waited and we waited for a long time to see if some of the major exchanges would actually list some options before we launched the show. But finally, we got tired of waiting for them. You know, and uh, quite frankly, and, you know, the audience was out there. The people were asking us about it. Guests were coming on from all across the crypto space. So we thought, why not encapsulate all that in one fun, easily digestible show? Well, Josh, like I mentioned, you were on back towards the latter portion of last year, October, early November time frame, I believe, right right around the time frame of the old FIA Expo. Uh, But for some of our listeners, this show obviously attracts a lot of new listeners or maybe aren't longtime listeners of the network. Why don't you go ahead and give our audience a little bit of an overview of your background in the derivatives and indeed in the crypto space, as well as what the heck it is you guys do over there at LXDX. Sure, sure, sure thing. Um, so my background is uh, I'm an HFT guy. I did a lot of uh, Delta One trading, a lot of uh, a lot of options trading, um, particularly really on like the, the kind of extreme low latency side. That was kind of always our, our mandate. Um, and uh, me and my, my co-founders of LXDX, we, we co-founded a high-frequency shop called GLT back in the day. And we got together and really uh, saw an opportunity to build uh, progressive, innovative exchange technology systems to, to, to target kind of traditional markets, but particularly cryptocurrency markets. Um, and so we, we have kind of our, our mandate, or perhaps our mission, is, is to build the technology that will power the future of capital markets, which... When I say it that way, it's a little bit dramatic. Um, but uh, I think that that while one one part of our business is helping people with exchanges improve pieces of their architecture, kind of like boutique low latency systems engineering, a big part of what we do is operate our own crypto exchange, which is eponymously named, perhaps confusingly as well, LXDX. And what was it that lured you to the dark side of crypto? Why not go out and start, you know, an equity dark pool or something like that? Why get into the crypto exchange biz? I think that we saw just kind of a lot of white space on the board in terms of products available at exchanges and exchanges that were kind of architected and built to the standards that we're familiar with in traditional markets. I think that that's, that's what really got us on the path uh, to do our own exchange. And I mean, a lot of the stuff that you get in traditional markets, like being able to co-locate with the exchange, knowing that your exchange is in a data center, um, not having to trade over the internet, if you don't, you know, like not having to trade, uh, with all the risk of just getting disconnected or latency spikes or all the problems you get from trading um, on kind of these websites. Uh, that's, that's kind of like what called us into action to like build our own thing, provide something where more serious guys can trade more performantly, more reliably, more safely. And we talked to, like I said, last year in like the October timeframe. So catch us up. What has been going on? What's, what's new? What's evolving? What's been happening in the world of LXDX since the last time you and I sat down and chatted? Sure. Um, so we launched in December, um, and uh, we're the first exchange in crypto to operate out of its own data center, not the cloud. Um, and we're the first crypto exchange that offered uh, levered products without the risk of socialized losses. And uh, about a month ago, we launched our warrants product, and we have warrants on Bitcoin, Ether, and Ripple. It's a little bit different approach than we've heard a lot of people coming to us with all kinds of different products in the crypto space. You guys are the first ones to approach us with warrants. Why go that way? Why take the, the crypto warrant approach? Sure. So I think that, that you know, sometimes the distinction between warrants and option is a little bit about like people have their own opinions on what, what that distinction is and what is a meaningful distinction. We often um, call them a poor man's option over here on the network. Sh- <laughs> sure, that's a fair, that's a fair, that's a fair distinction. I think that we we liked the term warrants for our options, uh, just because we like to think of them as cash products. They're cash settled. We trade them as if they're a cash product in the sense that we fully collateralize them. Um, so our our, our products, uh, they're they're basically like cash settled weeklies, and they're like single strike options. So you've got one call and one put for Bitcoin, Ether, and Ripple. We strike each one about ten percent of the money at the start of every week. Uh, and we do them actually as call spreads and put spreads. Uh, they're just very wide. Uh, so like the right now the ETH put is is currently like the 130 strike, uh, and the, the the put spread is actually 65 bucks uh, wide. So that's that's kind of like the capped maximum loss for the issuer or seller of the of the warrant. 
Interesting. That's an interesting approach. So a bit of a weekly warrant, almost got a little bit of a binary flavor to it as well, just given the short duration and the kind of the, you know, you're striking it kind of yes, no nature to it. So how, sure. how, how has that been in the early days? You know, you're kind of leading the charge there on the on the crypto warrant side. What is what has the uptake been from the market? Are they adopting the products? Are they trading them a lot? And also you're a former you're a former uh, liquidity provider. What's the uptake been on the liquidity providing side? How are the markets out there? Sure. So we've got a few market makers signed up to provide liquidity in the product. I think that, you know, if any product, you can talk yourself into never launching because you can convince yourself that you need to get 10 market makers and 10,000 people ready to go. I think anytime you do a new product, you have to expect that there's going to be uh, a period of trying to like a period of traction. Uh, and we're definitely still in that period of traction. So I think that our goal with launching this product was something that would allow people to participate from both the long and short side, allow people to speculate or hedge their volatility exposures, um, provide a product that that actually has a fair bit of synthetic leverage without kind of having to lend customers money. Um, and I think that sometimes uh, it's not really intuitive just how much leverage you know like a short dated option has. Uh, uh, like uh, the our like our ETH put for example is I guess it's. Uh, it's trading about five and a half bucks currently. Um, and uh, last night, ETH, ETH is down about $5 from last evening, so call it 2%. Uh, but that 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 put is up nearly 100% in the same amount of time. So it's a fair bit of juice because we're talking about these you know, high gamma, very, very short to expiry options all the time. That's where the fun is, right? The high gamma stuff. So uh, that, that otherwise, is, it is. That's, otherwise that's, it's just boring. Who wants to go out two years? Let's all let's all hang in the high in the high gamma stuff. So it sounds like you're kind of in that that chicken and the egg moment. I always talk about this with people who launch new products, no matter what it is, options, equities, anything in the financial realm. There's there's always that moment early on in the life of that product where you're trying to line up liquidity providers and other order flow providers, and they all say, "Yeah, we'll jump in as soon as there's some volume," right? And then the second, and then the other side of that is, of course, how do you get the volume if they don't jump in. So it's always that bit of a chicken and the egg. No one really wants to take that first leap. So so how are you guys going about incentivizing people to start trading this thing? Because that's obviously, especially in the early days, that's what it's all about, right? Sure. I mean, I think that, you know, we have market making relationships. Um, I think that we have other pieces of flow that like kind of like we, we go after flow that more than we go after customers. Um, and I think that there are kind of like guys that want to have this sort of exposure that have customers um, and they want to offer their customers kind of a safe way to trade with leverage. And so we go after kind of like the higher level guys to get that flow. And then we sort of leverage that flow to um, make it more attractive for liquidity providers. But definitely like we see, we've seen exchanges do all kinds of things to try and solve this problem. Like I think BATS gave away 20% of the exchange in equity uh, kind of to the guys that were the initial market makers for the platform. Um, so it's not, it's not crazy to do stuff like that. People have asked me like, Hey, like, would you give us a chunk of equity if we we provide liquidity? I'm not in a rush to do that. Like it's not, it's not an impossibility to provide, to set up relationships with that, like that with guys. But I think that we are in kind of a position to take kind of a measured controlled approach to getting, getting the products liquid, getting them to where we want them to be. And we're not, we're not going to do anything rash. Um, or gimmicky to to get to get volumes up. That was going to be my next question: Is you know, are you about to maybe give away some pieces of LXDX? That seems to be kind of the cost of doing business these days. When you spin up a new venue, like you mentioned, you know, Amex did that most recently. But that's that's kind of just the way the game is played these days in the options and equity world. If you want to get flow, people need to have some sort of incentive. It sounds like you guys aren't there yet in terms of giving out pieces and shares and equity in the exchange in return for order flow. I think that it's it's actually a very good model, right? Like I think that you know you want you want the the real product of an exchange is liquidity, you know, and and the thing that I'm selling and profiting from are liquidity providers showing up and make and providing markets all day long. So I think that it's reasonable that they they have an ownership stake for their efforts. I also just think that it's uh, it's kind of a quiet, cold market in crypto. So you know, like the deals you sign right now might not be the best deals you'd ever sign. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. They may uh, they may uh, come at you for a little bit more than they would maybe have taken back in the go go days of late uh, twenty 
uh, 17. Speaking of equity, you guys did have an interesting contest that kind of caught my eye. So you are, you were willing to give away equity, but to uh, referrers, people who referred new accounts to your exchange. How did that contest go? Did you give away any, any decent chunks of, uh, of the company to good referrers? We actually didn't. Uh, we ended up on. We ended up not going forward with the contest uh, just because of kind of legality issues with awarding shares of the of the company, and we ended up going kind of. We've kind of ended up not not taking that approach for for recruiting customers. To the exchange is a little bit different in an exchange business because you have a little bit more uh, regulatory exposure than in a consumer products business. <laughs> Yeah, go figure. They like to regulate those, you know, these days. That's sure. why that sure. contest caught my eye. I had never seen that before. So that was it certainly gets points for originality if, that's, uh, that's if, if for nothing else. Now, obviously, this is you're still in the early days of this. So is it fair to say that the that the big users right now are still on the institutional side? Or are you starting to get some traction with your retail crypto trader out there as well? I think that most of the interest we have is generally from guys on the institutional side. I think that you know we launched uh, we launched the weeklies because we thought that they were just kind of a very interesting product because again they have that gamma they get you that like a lot of leverage and 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 you let you trade from both sides of the market. I think that the product that institutional guys want is generally either longer dated stuff or some of the the products that we're likely to roll out next. So it's uh, I think that buy side guys they they're not a little bit less interested in trading weekly options generally. So the institutions don't want the high gamma products. They want a little bit more staid exposure to the marketplace, you're saying? For sure. I mean, I think that the appeal for anyone to be on the short side of products like this, like our warrants, any traditional market warrants to be an issuer generally is just data roll down carry, right? Like that you're you're generally selling vol at an inflated level to where fair value is. And I think that like I have the same expectation. I've seen the same thing with with our product, which is that that our our stuff trades at a a, a decent vol premium to where I, where OTC vols trade. And so, guys that are short the things, they have to put up. A, it's you know a capital efficiency thing. You have to put up a decent amount of money to be issuers to be short options all the time. But the kind of return on capital is pretty decent again, just because of that vol premium. That's that's an okay business. Uh, to, you know, to like keep rolling that vol premium trade, but. It's a little bit easier if it's further dated, and you have to roll it less often. Yeah, you're right. The institutions, it's, it's a lot of it's a lot of hassle for them to be playing in the, that front week portion of the curve when they could maybe right, right. a little saner, a little safer, go out a few weeks or in pray tell a few months perhaps and uh, get a little bit a little bit saner, cooler heads uh, out there. Now, I know one of the big selling points uh, for LXDX has been on the speed, the low latency side. Has that argument really been resonating with the institutional side? Is that is that still the case? Are you guys can you guys still claim that mantle as the as the fastest crypto exchange out there? Uh, I'm a hundred percent sure we're still the fastest crypto exchange out there. I think that the 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 latency argument has not been that compelling an argument for guys. Um, I think that the more compelling argument for market makers is not having to trade over the internet. I think that that most market makers would rather use their existing systems and existing infrastructure and plug in than have to write to you know another REST WebSocket API and then have to worry about oh like. I've got 50 orders outstanding in the market, um, and I have to I have to cancel them one by one out over the internet. I think that that like it's the it's the like operational and logistical challenges of trading over the internet that is less appealing than trading via co-location than necessarily the latency optimization side. And, you know, we've seen a lot of people offer interesting, esoteric new products in the crypto space for a while. Everyone obviously gets excited about BitMEX, but you have to go through a VPN if you want to trade that in the U.S. What is what is the legal and regulatory status of your products? I know from a legal perspective, you guys are headquartered out there in Malta. Can a typical American go and trade your products? Do they need to maybe jump through some hoops in order to use them? Uh, unfortunately, we don't take any U.S. customers for our products. Uh, I think that we take a little bit stronger of an approach to restrict customers than some of the other platforms. Um, we we require that you uh, KYC AML with a non-U.S. passport to trade those products. I think that that everyone is kind of cautious right now in terms of uh, you know making sure that they have a healthy positive relationship with regulators when when that's something that's still in play. Some of the platforms, you know, they jurisdiction in places where 
there is no relevant regulator, uh, and they're they're sort of free to do whatever they want. So you're saying you guys do more than just put a little splash warning on your homepage saying, you know, if you're from the U.S., you may not want to, you may not be able to do this. You, you guys go a little bit beyond that. That's that's our current policy. Um, I think that we, you know, like we have a we have a good relationship with uh, the Maltese regulators. Um, we we think that it's uh, a, a great place for us to kind of do the sorts of businesses we want to do in crypto. And while the U.S. market is an important customer base to us and we want to make sure that we can deliver products to them, I don't think it will be out of LX, DX, Malta big picture. I think that, that it's, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult way to, to, to target the U.S. market. And ultimately, I think that uh, to have a compelling product for U.S. customers, we want a U.S. product for them. That would certainly help open the floodgates. You know, speaking of opening the floodgates, do you foresee any thawing on the regulatory side in the U.S. anytime soon? You, are you optimistic that we'll maybe see some, uh, some products make their way into the U.S. space sometime soon? Or is it still pretty much uh, par for the course as, as far as what you guys see on the regulatory front? You know, I think that, that it's, it's the, US, the U.S. is kind of an interesting situation because I think you've got so many guys that have chased after ATS licenses that they've kind of they've kind of broken the system. Like, you know, I think that there were 55 people with ATSs uh, as of maybe like the middle of last year. And, and now I heard that there's 100 crypto ATS applications pending. And, and clearly that doesn't really make sense. Clearly, you know, you see, you've got kind of like, we just don't really have the right architecture and systems in place for people to really do these sorts of products in the US with with maybe the exception of, of of actually, you know, CFTC licensed exchanges. It's just they haven't they haven't found that much traction yet. Um, you know, Ledger X is, is continues to roll out new products, um, but again, it's the collateralization and capital efficiency challenge uh, in in that in that spot, in that in, in that world. Well, certainly, if you're going after the uh, European audience in particular with your products, I think you went the right way. Warrants are, have always been, in my mind, a predominantly European product. So coming up with a, a warrant on the crypto space, I think there might be some resonance for that, particularly for the, for the European audience. Is that what you guys are seeing out there? Is that what your predominantly early users are? Yeah, I mean, I think that we, you know, like we looked at the, the kind of regulatory uh, climate, not not just the set of the rules, but kind of like the backdrop of, of what's happening globally. And, and you know, I think globally there's a push for regulators to protect retail from trading CFDs um, and, and from trading like you know like speculative high leverage stuff. We've seen increased regulation there. We've seen increased regulation globally on binary options. So we we knew we wanted to do a product that would allow people to trade of leverage. We we wanted a product that sort of wasn't in in either category. Uh, of things like we wanted, we didn't want to do a product that we knew the regulators didn't want us to do, even if there was a technicality way to do it. Uh, and so we designed a product that we thought sort of has many of the benefits of those things, which clearly retail likes to trade, but are potentially unsafe for retail to trade because ultimately retail loses a lot of money trading CFDs and, and trading binary options. So we wanted something where our customers can get the exposure they want, but not necessarily kind of have it be sort of so sort of degenerative for them. And we get a lot of questions about a Bitcoin ETF, a Bitcoin ETF. Is that going to be the straw that finally breaks the camel's back here in the U.S.? Is that going to open the floodgates and pave the way for a whole bunch of new crypto-related products in the near future? Do you think that's what we're missing here in the U.S.? Do you think it's going to be the final approval of an ETF that really kind of gets the ball rolling here? I think that that's a tough one. Um, I think that to generally speaking, I think an ETF is not that that big of a game changer. I mean, I think that for people that want to buy Bitcoin, it's not that hard to buy Bitcoin. And I think that that Bitcoin is already fractionalized, you know, so it's not like it's not like a REIT or something like that where it's too expensive to buy a building and you can buy a share in the building. Like you can always just go buy 0.01 Bitcoin somewhere. It's pretty easy to create an account and go buy spot much easier than any other asset, really, when you think about it, like it's hard to buy spot gold. Uh, but it's it's easy to buy spot Bitcoin, so I think that that uh, you know big picture retail side I think ETF very very minor. Um, I think that on the institutional side I think it could have a pretty powerful effect just because there hasn't been clarity around spot trading. I think if there is clarity around spot trading, then I think that the ETF might be a bit of an afterthought. 
Interesting. I say different people have different perspectives. Some think that's going to be the best thing since sliced bread. Sounds like you're on the other side of that equation. Well, I guess we'll find out maybe hopefully soon when we finally get for some, sure, for sure. get some I mean, approvals look, I think here. It's, it's good for everyone if there's if an ETF passes. I think it's it's a sign of kind of the end of the the lack of clarity and hawkishness that have surrounded kind of crypto regulation in the U.S. So I'd love to see it happen. I just think that it might not be as transformative as, as, as other things. That's true. It'll be a big moment, whether it's the watershed moment people hope it is, we'll, I guess we'll see. But it, may, it might at the very least accrete some flow into some of these products, which at the end of the day is a good thing uh, going forward. Speaking of going forward, you've kind of hinted at some interesting things. What is coming down the pike from you and your team? It sounds like you're getting away from the weekly warrants, getting into some longer duration, some newer type products. What, what can we expect in the coming months from LXDX? Sure. So I think that the two big products that will come down our pipeline will be some longer dated warrants with potentially a few more with warrants on a few more coins. Um, that's kind of like the, the next thing to roll out. And then we're also going to roll out a trade at settle product. And that's uh, that's one of the things that we think is missing in the space and could be pretty appealing to uh, to guys that want to buy blocks or chunks of cryptocurrency without having to move a price around all day or without having to have a market maker move quotes around all day. And Josh, if people want to go learn more about what you guys are doing at LXDX, where should they go? What should they do? I think that the best place to find us is either, uh, I mean, LXDX.co. Um, you can find us on Medium. You can find us on Twitter. Um, we're pretty, pretty active on all three. Meanwhile, you can find him chiming in, chiming in with me on our next segment. It is time to keep on rolling into the Bitcoin Breakdown. It's time to explore the latest trading activity, trends, and developments across the world's leading crypto market. It's time for the Bitcoin Breakdown. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Bitcoin Breakdown, the segment where the name pretty much says it all. We break down the week that was in the world of Bitcoin trading out there across the broad slew of products, maybe some of the options, some of the futures, the spot, all that good stuff. Uh, coming into showtime here, we're at about a 37.05 on uh, Bitcoin, which is off not quite 100 handles, but pretty close to it from where we were about a week ago. So at the very least, seems like the, the near-term bullish upside explosion that we saw on last week's show and the week leading up to it has somewhat abated uh, out there. There is There are some good signs for the bulls. We'll get to those in a little bit. This is one of the first times in a while, I think about six months, uh, that we could actually look on the month-to-month -month charts of closes for Bitcoin and actually see an uptick, see, see, see some green out there. So that maybe is a, is a sign of some hope, uh, some optimism out there in the land of all things Bitcoin. Of course, we hit that recent near-term high, at least from the, in the time frame we're looking at here, back on February 28th, around the 3,900 level. We did dip ever so briefly below 3,700, right around the 36 half level, but now we're back up around that 3,700 level again, which is, seems to be where we're solidifying here for the time being. And Josh... Uh, we were just talking about your platform and your warrants. You guys have seen some interesting, I'm sure, activity in the still early days. But uh, anything interesting trading over there on LXDX, maybe on the Bitcoin warrants or anything along those lines that maybe might be informative to our audience, maybe some one-sided flow? Or what kind of stuff are you seeing on the platform in these early days? I think that for us, most of the activity has been on the ETH side of things. I think that ETH particularly just in the last few weeks has been uh, – relatively the most volatile of, of things out there and, and understand and and understandably particularly when you lever that up in the option space can be pretty crazy i think uh maybe feb 24th or 23rd there was like a 30 dollar move in ethereum um so there's definitely been some action in in eth yeah that's been an area we've been watching of course we'll get to that in our next segment, which is, of course, the, the altcoin universe, where we get to everything outside of Bitcoin, I want to check in with our cohorts here on the show as well, our friends over there at Akuna, to see what they've been uh, uh, seeing out there. And they actually noted some fairly sizable options activity uh, going up on Deribit. Uh, so interesting, interesting stuff out there. Deribit, of course, a platform that does have access to some of these, uh, these products out there. And uh, they noted it was, it looks like a put ladder. That's something you see very often uh, on the strikes of it was April, so expiring in April, April, April this year, uh, four thousand thirty seven half thirty five hundred put ladder going up. Looks like about five hundred times. So pretty decent size uh, for these types of markets. So, again, total of about fifteen 
hundred contracts on it. They said the the notional value of the trade was right around uh, two million dollars, and they bought it for a bit of a small credit. Obviously, even though it went up on Deribit, arranged OTC. Uh, so some interesting size, interesting strikes as well. Four thousand thirty-seven half, uh, thirty-five hundred. Again, you don't see some of these uh, funkier type spreads. I'm just looking here. What other? What else was lighting it up out here on uh, some of those contracts? <laughs> Looks like 5,000 calls going up uh, 282 times as well. That's uh, an optimistic individual. Uh, these are going out in March as well. So maybe I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's probably closing paper. But then again, you never know. There could be the bulls out there in force. And speaking of the products out there, the Bitcoin futures, another fairly active week, if not every day this week was uh, lighting it up. We did see some fairly uh, active paper out there in the uh, Bitcoin futures to the term of we're seeing coming into showtime. The futures are shy of the 3,700 level down to about uh, 3,675 or so. They were off quite a bit as well, about 125 handles. Actually, they're a little bit shy of 37 now, 3,695 in that front March contract. Looks like about 4,500 contracts have gone up. So not a huge volume day, but a decent volume day out there in the futures. Remember, that's a 5X contract. So you're talking roughly around 25,000 coins changing hands. The biggest day was, in terms of volume on these futures, was back on the 28th, with which about a little over 6,000 contracts uh, changing hands out there. And then we saw on that Friday, the first uh, very anemic day, a little over a thousand, about eighteen hundred or so. So it was kind of a, a tale of different uh, different volume stories, depending on which day uh, you were looking out there. In terms of what's been making the news out there in uh, in Bitcoin, like people are always writing to us saying, "Where where is the bullish case for Bitcoin? Is there one?" We talked about some technical signals last week. There, you know, the moving averages were starting to look a little bit bullish. If you are a believer in all sorts of technicals when it comes. Uh, to Bitcoin. They got another one out there for you this week. Those of you who believe in money flow, that's starting to look a little bit uh, bullish as well. Remember, these kind of indicators tend to encapsulate and kind of maybe come in at the end of some of these longer term trends. People like money flow because it actually involves volume as well. So it's not just a purely price based uh, type of indicator. And that one, of course, is hitting some near term lows, which people out there who follow such things say, that is perhaps a sign of bullish opportunities ahead. So those combined with the moving averages recently, maybe starting to turn a little bit bullish as well as, of course, we're coming up on that halving period right around 500 plus days out from the Bitcoin halving. All of that, people who are in the bullish camp tend to say that is a bit of a bullish story. Of course, on the flip side, we have the price action we saw this past week, which has been mostly bearish. So <laughs> I guess it's a tale of uh, two trading markets. That's what makes a market out there at the end of the day. But the big news out there in uh, all things Bitcoin this past week, and not just Bitcoin, but in, in crypto in general, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on this as well, Josh, is uh, the, the big hubbub, the big furor over Coinbase buying what is effectively, apparently, a people with spyware ties. Uh, they bought a firm called Neutrino back on the 19th of February. And uh, if you've been paying attention to this show or anything in the crypto space at all, you know cybersecurity is pretty much job number one. In fact, Josh, you run a crypto venue. How frequently do you have cybersecurity conversations with your clients? Would you say it's top of mind pretty much every given day? I think that as an exchange, you are at the absolute front lines of guys that want to attack you. And if you don't take security seriously, uh, you're seriously kidding yourself. It's like the, it's, you're, you're at a space of, of crimes of opportunity are abundant. Um, and you know, we, we take security very, very seriously. Um, we're very, very paranoid and always scared of uh, the, the large amount of dedicated adversaries out there who would love to target um, who love targeting exchanges. Um, Par paranoid so, and always scared. It's a good way to be, I think, as a crypto exchange these days, sir. I think that that's, that's true. I mean, I think that the, the Coinbase thing is, you know, it's, it's bad optics. Um, it's, it's, you know, like, it's bad optics for the space. I think that a lot of, a lot of the, the challenge, I think, in crypto is that, like, while we do consider them a competitor to us to some degree, like, we're all kind of, in the same business and we all want to see the ecosystem grow, the market grow, the total opportunity, the total pie grow. Um, and so anything that, that damages people's faith in 
these markets is bad for all of us. And so, yeah, it's, it's not a great thing. It's not like we, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely bearish for us. We interpret this as bearish in the same way we, we interpret the Quadrica news as very, very bearish for the space. Yeah, you know, anything that seems to reinforce these cybersecurity concerns is a negative thing. And it seems like week after week on this, we could do an entire show just based on the cybersecurity issues and kerfuffles that uh, that pop up in the crypto space every week. But yeah, in terms of optics, I think you hit it on the head. This is this is pretty bad optics. They acquired, like I said, that firm called uh, Neutrino, uh, the primary officers of whom were all members of another company called Hacking Team which sold spyware to a variety of regimes around the world, including the U.S., uh, but also Kazakhstan, Saudi Arabia, and some other very oppressive regimes around the world. And that software allowed people to effectively, these governments, to install implants and different computers. Obviously, all the things spyware does, you know, man monitoring network traffic, Skype calls, that sort of thing. Uh, in fact, the Reporters Without Borders organization termed this team this company, uh, one of the five corporate enemies of the internet back in 2013, for those of you who follow along with such things. So optics-wise, particularly for the very cybersecurity-obsessed and also, shall we say, a little bit libertarian, anti-government-leaning uh, crypto space, the, the combo of both of those things, perhaps a security vulnerability with a firm that was working with a lot of these large government organizations, that, that combo is, is just not a good thing for the coin, for the optics, for Coinbase and all that leading to all these little furors we see out there, little, fur you know, little tempest in a teapot, teapot in terms of, you know, people looking to remove their Coinbase accounts and things like that. So we see a lot of that. I don't like to dig too deep into that, but that is top of mind for a lot of people out there in the crypto space, at least these days. Speaking of the crypto space, let's get into things that aren't Bitcoin with a little bit of the old altcoin universe. It's time to move beyond Bitcoin and find out what's moving the rest of the crypto marketplace. It's time to boldly venture into the, the altcoin, altcoin universe. universe. All right, welcome to the altcoin universe. We talk about everything that isn't Bitcoin, except right here at the top. And we talk about the top 10 coins by market cap here coming into showtime. Bitcoin, of course, still going to be number one with about $65 billion in market cap. Number two, ETH. As Josh was alluding to, an active time out there, 13 and a quarter billion in market cap. Uh, then we have XRP number three with about a little over 12 billion. EOS number four, about 3.35 billion. Then Litecoin number five, about two and three quarters billion. Uh, Bitcoin Cash up there pretty good too, 2.16 billion out there. And then it kind of continues to drop off. Stellar, Tron, Bitcoin SV, and Cardano rounding out the top 10 out here. But you were talking earlier, Josh, about the most activity you've seen on your platform lately has been in ETH. Uh, what kind of trades, what kind of activity are you seeing out there in your ETH warrants these days? Um, I think that for us, there's been most of the ETH trades have just been buyers of ETH puts, of the weekly puts. Um, I think that that's been the most active product on the exchange uh, since the products have launched. Um, I think that that the trend that we're following kind of bigger picture is uh, both what's happening with uh, just the price action in ETH has been has been dramatic, but also the the, the state of like where volumes have been is, is shifting around a bit. Um, you know, like ETH volumes have been kind of progressively uh, like globally higher the past the past two months. Yeah, you know, I was talking to our, our friends over there at Acuna there before the show, just checking in on what kind of volume they've been seeing out there. And they said something interesting. They said that to them, ETH has been actually weak ever since that Constantinople upgrade. Uh, what was that, about a week ago or so? So uh, interesting stuff from them. It sounds like you're seeing the opposite. You're seeing a lot of action uh, on ETH and all to the put side, which maybe shows people aren't, aren't buying that recent resurgence we saw out there, Josh. Yeah, and I think that that spike up to like 165-ish was uh, a dramatic move, uh, sort of like the, the pace of the rest of the market. So it doesn't surprise me that, that people are looking to fade that. Yeah, other moves we're seeing out there. XRP not really moving a lot over the past week, still around the 30 cent level. You know, it kind of had contrasting news last week. It had the bullish news that was finally listed on Coinbase. So that gave it a little bit of a pop round to about 32 or so. But also there's the concerns of this new JPM coin coming in, maybe stealing a lot of their thunder. Uh, so that all of that seems to have 
negated itself out and it's, it's still around 30 uh, coming into the show this week. Litecoin up to around 46 this week, uh, up from around, it was in the 42 range sometime last year. That's another one that's kind of broken out of its range uh, to the upside. It was in the 30s not too long ago, and now we're talking about it 46 up here this week. So there's been a lot of action out there, uh, even though uh, some of these products are coming off a little bit still. A lot of interesting, uh, interesting movement, a lot of interesting developments out there in the world of the altcoin. I want to make sure some of you guys get featured on the show as well. So without further ado, let's get to some of your crypto questions. You've got questions about crypto. Who doesn't? It's time to find out the answers to your crypto questions. All right, welcome to your segment, the crypto question segment, where you guys fire off your questions about all things Bitcoin, digital assets. Uh, Charlotte's got a question here, Josh. She wants to know, do we think other big banks will follow uh, JP Morgan's lead with their own coins? Of course, the big news in the last week's show was the, announce, the announcement of that JPM coin. Effectively, they're taking a bit of a stab at Ripple with their own payment coin. I'm curious uh, if you have any thoughts on that, Josh, in general. Do you think that was as big of a deal as some other people do? And then B, do you think, as Charlotte wants to know, do you think other banks are going to follow suit with their own coins? I think that uh, I think that the JPM coin is a pretty big deal. I think that it shows that that more serious guys are looking to blockchain solutions to, to aid with payments. I think it's obviously competitive with with Ripple, um, but I think at the end of the day, it would not surprise me to see a few other banks come out with their own optimizations to their payment systems, leveraging blockchain technology. And it seems like a natural fit for for both the players and for the for the solution. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's, it, JP Morgan, obviously, they said that they had somewhere around $5 trillion in payments that they processed on a given day. So all of these big banks, Goldman and others, have similar network effects that they can apply even a small percentage of that to a coin that they control and own, that's that's a good thing for them. It's the selling point, of course, is it's supposed to be a lot more price stable than an XRP, which has moved all over the place from up to north of three dollars not too long ago, down to about thirty cents right now. That sort of price volatility not exactly attractive if you want a very stable coin for transacting payments. And of course, they get to keep it in their own house, like they do with the dark pools and other things that they do out there. So if they have their own coin, they get to transact some of their own payments on something that they control that's more stable. It's a win for a lot of people, so I, I wouldn't be surprised to see other firms following their lead. I think they're all letting JPM kind of carve, uh, be a little bit of a vanguard there and see how they fare and then maybe following suit afterward. Let's see here. Alex, Alex King wants to know, what products would you like to see listed in the crypto space soon? Well, I'm, I'm still going to keep beating the drum for the actual listed on a lit U.S. venue options. I know I can go to BitMEX with a VPN and a bunch of these other things that are out there. They all exist. I know they exist. So before you write in, we know that. We talk about them on the show before. But they're obviously not ideal solutions. And there's a lot of issues with having to tunnel in through a VPN through a place that ostensibly you're not supposed to be trading. Uh, so <laughs> that's what we would like for our audience to see is some lit listed options, maybe on the futures at CME or wherever else. We can get these things going, but actual lit options products that our users can sink their teeth into if they want to buy a put on Bitcoin, if they want to buy calls or verticals or trade some all these strategies they'd like to do all the time. I would love to see something like that. Obviously, I'm down the ra options rabbit hole. So maybe, Josh, you have a different viewpoint on what you'd like to see listed next in the crypto space. Uh, to be honest, I think the thing I would like to see uh, next in the U.S. is I'd love to see Coinbase launch their kind of institutional solution for trading. You know, like they're they're supposed to go live with their own data center and new APIs. Um, I think that that could have a meaningful impact. I realize that spot trading is a little bit passe, um, but I do think that having a, uh, a higher quality, more serious spot venue in the U.S. could be an enabler for for other for other businesses to be built on top. What Coinbase Pro doesn't do it for you, Josh? That's, that's not enough for you? Not quite enough yet. <laughs> not quite there, huh, for Coinbase Pro. Uh, interesting, interesting on uh, seeing more about the platform side, which I would expect from someone who runs a platform. Uh, let's see. we got one more here. we got time for this oh, from the creatively named DXXT9L. Try saying that five times fast. They want to know, why are the margin requirements 
for Bitcoin futures so onerous? Well, I think you have to look to when these products were unveiled and launched. It was in the heady, heady go-go days of late 2017. Bitcoin was marching inexorably, at least so we thought, towards that 20,000 level. The regulators were scrambling to get ahead of this thing. So it was a lot of things that going on where firms were just terrified of all things, all things crypto. And uh, it was an area where I think to get these things listed. There were a lot of scenarios being painted, at least to us, that we saw of people getting crazy with leverage and wiping themselves out in a product that was already inherently volatile. So I think in order to appease the regulators, they made the margin effectively a, a one-to-one. There's not a lot of margin to be had in a lot of these futures. Uh, Josh, is that your take as well, that effectively it was just to appease the regulators and get these products out the door, that they made them perhaps not quite as levered as some people would like? Yeah, I think that, I think that's 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 definitely the the bulk of it. I mean, I also think that if you're a broker or you're an exchange, while while crypto is a fast growing product, it's still in the grand scheme of things a pretty small market. Um, and these products, you know, like the they're they're it's unclear like how good the prices are, how good your indices are, how much they could be manipulated. And so there is kind of like this tail risk of some massive manipulation. Or short squeeze where you know Bitcoin futures trade to two hundred thousand, even if fair value is, you know, back then twenty thousand. I think was the kind of like the dread, like what stops some crazy tail black swan event happening, which then opens up the broker or the exchange to like a more global risk exposure for products that probably weren't going to be huge profit centers anyway. So I think that that's there's some of that too, you know, like you, you just, it's, it's a one product that, that potentially adds risk to the entire business of, of these other guys. Well, that music, unfortunately, means we've come to the end of another fun episode of the Crypto Rundown. Thanks for joining us here on the show. Before we go, uh, Josh, you already kind of talked about where people can find uh, all your great stuff coming up at LXDX. And maybe if you want to leave them with one more hint one more tease of what they can look forward to coming from you guys and your team. Now is the time, sir. The floor is yours. Perfect. Well, uh, yeah, come check out the product if you're in the U.S. Uh, unfortunately, sorry, you can't trade it yet. But uh, LXDX.co, we have warrants on three cryptos. We're going to have more warrants and more innovative blockchain derivatives coming soon. There you go. More innovative blockchain derivatives coming soon. LXDX.co is the place to go to learn more. And on behalf of Josh and our friends at Akuna and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for listening live, for sending in your questions. Keep them all coming. We love to hear from you. And we'll see you next week for more of the Crypto Rundown. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.